So the next moderator is just probably one of the most brilliant minds in the industry. <laughs> An excessively handsome, let's say middle-aged gentleman. Wow, I'm flattered. So, our next panel is talking about the sell side at sales tech stack. And I think that, you know, when we look at the various panels we've had today, certainly two panels ago, we heard from the broadcasters and some of the things they wanted, and I think now it's interesting to match that with what's going on on the technology side from the vendors. So what we're going to do is we're going to head down the line. I'm going to ask each one of you to introduce yourselves and talk about your firm, what you do, your value in one sentence. And I'm stealing this from a moderator of a panel in the past. I'd like you to tell us one, two, or three pieces of content you're consuming today. Glenn. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, I am Glenn Sinisa. I am the CTO of Operative. Uh, at Operative, we are an enterprise technology software provider. We have a strong portfolio of solutions across sales, traffic, uh, and content. Our mission at Operative is to enable and empower our media companies to have choice. Choice in how they compete, choice in where they compete, and choice in how they differentiate. Um, in terms of content, uh, a few things, right? So I, I absolutely love TED Talks, right? So I have a, a you know, due to travel and all that, I, I tend to watch things offline, but uh, I have the, the TED Talks app. I saw a very interesting piece of content last night, actually, and it was, it was, it was getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? I think there was, you know, a lot of takeaways at, you know, at an individual level, at a company level, and really at an industry level when you think about, you know, sort of innovation. Um, and then just a couple of fun things, right? It's Oscar season, I downloaded Star is Born, beautiful movie, recommend it for everybody. And then, you know, I'm, I'm a sports fanatic, I've lived in a number of different countries, so, I'm, you know, my support stays is very sort of un-American. I use the NBC Sports app to keep me sort of live up to date with, with sports around Thank you. My name, my name is Mike Processions, and uh, I work for... Um, you work for? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, uh, I work for Extreme Reach, and uh, our company uh, handles the movement of the AI trading from the buy side to the sell side. And, uh, we're working on a number of solutions for the sell side, which is my responsibility <clears throat> to help build out some of those. Excuse me, those And uh, let's see, this is that question of uh, if you were a color, what color would you be? Is this kind of the media thing? You know, I like um, movies that take some uh, you know, very scientific concepts and put them into a very questioning place like, uh, oh, Interstellar or, uh, uh, what's the, what's the one? Uh, AI one, I'm sorry. Yeah. Forgetting the name of it. Anyway, um, and then I've become a junkie of uh, news. I think that's the new WWF <laughs> combined with uh, reality TV. <laughs> Some of the things have to turn it off and walk away, but uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it makes you mad, it makes you crazy, and, uh, but it's kind of fun to watch the crash happen in the middle. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad that everyone got a drink and a time to refresh. Hopefully, uh, we can keep you awake. My name is Tim Swift. I'm the VP of Platform Services at Wide Orbit. Um, by way of context, I uh, previously had a broadcast hat, now vendor hat. Bringing to the uh, bring to the table, wide order. Many of you are familiar with, but uh, we provide a full suite from uh, order to cash, as far as uh, on the on the sell side of things and uh, addressing the broadcast world. My media consumption at the moment, uh, most recently, was a uh, audible book. Uh, Michelle Obama's Becoming it was this morning. What I, what I was listening to as I ran. Uh, there will be the odd occasion that I'll have to. Uh, Put up with a Spotify playlist for my 21 year old daughter when I want to spend time with her in the, uh, in the car. And uh, beyond that, if I get some time to myself, I'm uh, subjecting myself to Jack Ryan, uh, the, uh, the Prime series. Okay, I like it. I, uh, I feel like my consumption is less intellectual. I've been watching Joel and Leah on YouTube, uh, the two British folks that talk about differences between the US and Britain. 
Um, so, first where I'd like to start off is where the panel um, with Al and Joe, Joe ended uh, regarding tips. So, uh, there's been a lot of conversations, of course, around tips. Uh, I will say that even when I heard from James the definition of what tips was, I've heard multiple definitions from different broadcasters, and they're different. Um, as an example, I had visited uh, somebody a few weeks ago, and their definition of tips was, we want every system to be able to ingest and give data. We want that to be able to move from system to system and be completely clean and never have a problem. And we want to be able to pick and choose which parts of your software we buy and don't buy and fill it into that stack. So with that, what I'd like to start is I'm going to start with you, Glenn. When you hear about tips, how do you define tips in your world? And what do you view as the challenges that we need and you need to overcome to at least make something? Sure. Um, my understanding of tips, of the tip initiative, is it is a consortium of companies coming together to define a set of standards by which we can scale data integration uh, amongst each other. Right? Plain and simple. Like you know, it's not that simple though. Um, I, I think the getting getting tips to work is fundamentally dependent on one thing, and that is adoption. And you know, adoption will live and fail depending on setting appropriate expectations for what we want the TIP initiative to accomplish. I think if we set a very high bar and say, okay, we're gonna define a set of canonical data schemas that are gonna be 100% all encompassing across all vendors and everybody needs to follow this, I believe that's setting a bar that is setting us up for disillusionment. When you have disillusionment, you're you're going to get failed adoption. And I think if we approach TIP, I think you know, first and foremost, I think the vendors themselves need to collaborate, and we need to open up our, our own data architectures, our own data models, and identify you know the the commonality of data elements amongst ourselves. And if if we set an expectation that if we can get to 60 percent, seventy percent, and we'll live with that. I think that's a huge accomplishment. I think if we if we approach it that you know the, the tip initiatives, the schemas that are defined there don't encompass all of the attribution, the data elements that we need, therefore we're not going to use it, we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that doesn't serve anybody any good. So I think, you know, let's let's not set ourselves up for disillusionment. Let's all collaborate together, which means the vendors together, and let's identify the commonality across you know, inventory and sales and things like that, that um, we need to traverse amongst ourselves. Are you uh, heading to Bunker? Or no, I was going to jump, jump to you. And I'd like to ask that same question, but with an add-on. In this idea that Glenn mentions about us coming together and setting those standards, it's an interesting concept. And how do we do it in a way where we can just say, here's the standards, but we're not all competing to own this part of the world or that part of the world. Well, I think the first thing that probably needs to be addressed is that as, as far as the TIP initiative has, uh, as far as it has gone to date with the, um, it being brought about by a number of the broadcasters, um, they've done a phenomenal job to be able to architect some of these standards. There's a recognition that the execution of those, of that architecture, needs to then engage the vendors to be able to execute on um, So that is, I think, probably the first step that really needs to occur in order to, have, in order to actually address how TIP will actually continue to progress. Then heading on to Glenn, this is a statement about the vendors coming together. Absolutely, without that, it, it is going to fail. Um, the execution piece, as it relates to uh, the development of software, um, standards by themselves don't achieve it. Uh, there needs to be the technology behind it in order to actually create those interfaces. Beyond that, there's also what we understand is that you, as the users, need to have an interface that is actually workable and it's usable. 
So what we've translated that through to is uh, an involvement with the TIP uh, committee in consulting with them on the standards. So back to Glenn's point, taking what is currently there, recognising that there may be things that need to be added to, or even translated from something that's in existence at the moment, using a specific format that needs to actually replace it. Is TIPS about just current technology and getting it all to work, or does it address the idea, and I mentioned this to you back there, is that this idea that at some point in time, and we'll get to your question next on this, where we can learn from you, Bunker, at some point in time, somebody's going to say, I have this great idea to take advantage of this new technology. For example, you look at smart, smart speakers. Maybe there's a certain point in time when Google and, and uh, Amazon open up how you might be able to advertise. Somebody comes up with certain technologies to take advantage of that. They're not going to think about standards, right? So how do we develop a situation where at some point those new technologies can plug and play into these systems? Well, I think it behooves us as technology providers to be thinking that part forward. Um, it's a balancing act, right, between the here and now um, as broadcasters, understanding that there are margins that are getting sweet. We've got to address that at the here and now. But equally so, when it comes to future opportunities, we've got to be able to say, well, uh, how do we develop towards that as well? Um, there are great minds that exist in, in many of these companies. They're going to bring those forward as we will as vendors. Together as a collaboration, that's what we've got to address. It may be some of those opportunities are not foreseen but yet will become apparent as we actually move down the road. And, and so, Bunker, from your perspective, you see this, right? You all develop new technologies to be able to bridge gaps and move in creative across multiple platforms. When you all started out, how did you view those challenges? What lessons did you learn in bringing convergent technologies together that other legacy technology companies could learn from? Well, I think if we can hear me, I think if we start um, from linear television, right, it was the challenge of getting creative distributed. So, you know, one, one piece of creative to hundreds of television stations was relatively straight, straightforward, but complicated to do because we didn't have any infrastructure to deliver it. And, you know, we, the traffic instructions, we heard about that earlier this morning. So, those were the two main challenges for executing in the linear world. Um, now what we're seeing though is the problem has moved over to the cell side because what's happened is new technologies have opened up new opportunities for programmers to create inventory on these new outlet chains. So now they have to, when they, when they go to push their feature content into these platforms, they now have to follow up with their monetization strategy, which means they've got to be creative in position in origin servers so that when we finish these other layers of buying and selling, we're now trying to execute a campaign with an ad decision engine. Um, the creative is ready to stream stitch into the uh, <clears throat> directly into the program with the right technical spaces. Interestingly, to me, is the, the linear world. We're, we're really uh, we were always about protecting three brands at the same time. We had an advertiser, we had a programmer, and we had a channel or an outlet that we're all, all concerned about the user experience. And if the user experience was poor, it affected poorly in all three of them. When you go over to the digital world and you're putting in the early days banner up next to a piece of content that's dis disassociated with that, it didn't matter if it wasn't quite perfect or it wasn't in context or appropriate. Now we're stream stitching ads into content on that device. And um, so we've got to worry about several of the classic things that we've worried about in linear television, which is brand protection all the way around, regulatory compliance and contractual compliance, things like the JCC and frequency, and that you know, we're struggling with how we're going to be able to manage that. So in the tech stack, we're investing in trying to figure out how to make this linear and digital world fit together. And to me, the collision zone is in set top of the right now because we've got digital inventory and uh, or inventory type set. So, so when you go about making this decision to invest in doing that on the digital side, 
is that about protecting the current business you have or about growing your business? And is that a good ROI on your investment? Uh, I, I think it's both. I, I don't, it's, uh, the, the challenge has moved and, and we need solutions in those areas. So I don't think it's about necessarily uh, you know, collapsing anything we're doing now. However, I think that, uh, you know, if, if you ask who's going to win linear or digital in terms of the way we execute ad campaigns, it seems more like the like digital suite of how we do campaign execution, including creative and buying and selling, will overcome linear or digital. So I guess I would say I see that uh, solutions we're creating for the future are going to replace some of the ones that we have today. So it's interesting. So Joe Fivash said on his panel that our desire for return on investment is significantly higher than theirs. I think that is a completely fair statement, as I believe. Well, I'm not sure about your firm, but I know that several of us here are private equity on, and I know I certainly want to make money. Um, so, Glenn, let me ask you. I think about this in this manner. We are asked some, sometimes to do things for Spot TV, for example. And I agree with the concept that Spot will never fully go away. It just makes total sense. And, uh, however, there is a future that is coming. And so when we invest our dollars in working on things that are current sort of traditional ways of selling versus future that has less value. So how do you all make that decision where you're putting your dollars and where you're investing into tech? Yeah, so it's a very delicate uh, balancing act that um, I think with architecture and technology we have today, it's actually become easier. But I think it's, it's worth you know taking a look at how it was done in the past and done very poorly in the past, right? So I think as a software vendor, it's very it's a delicate balancing act of, of wanting to support your key customers, your strategic customers, with building something in a core solution, a market-facing solution um, that is crossed with the way they see it. But at the same time, they provide revenue, they've got a viewpoint. And so, you know, the temptation has always been there in the past where we create custom software, we branch code, and we create, you know, we, we, we basically create an island of software. Um, and it, it's, you know, in the end, it's very difficult to manage. It's expensive for us to manage, and customers, you know, typically don't like it because, you know, they're not receiving all the enhancements that go, you know, sort of in the core. And, you know, the, the, the latest advancements in architecture today leverage a style of architecture that's known as microservices development. What well, microservices development is, is it's in stark contrast to the way we always used to build things, which is called monolithic architecture, in which there are tight interdependencies across data, across engines, across um, elements within the system. And so that's what led us down the path of creating these big, fat, you know, sort of branches and, and for lack of a better word, frank and set software. And so today, we have microservices architecture that allows us to build in a decoupled manner. So in a way, you know, you can kind of build, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too, because we have this concept of, of what are called versions of microservices. So we can build, you know, engines that, as we see fit, or microservices that are designed for the core market is the way we see them. And if customers, you know, want us to enhance that in a way that gives them differentiating capability in the market, we can version off a microservice. But that microservice, since it's decoupled, operates, still operates with everything else. So from that perspective, you get away out of, you know, you get away from building company, you know, um, customized software and get away and, and establish something that is very scalable. You still have a core product and you give the customer the differentiated differentiation that they that they need. Wow. Your cake and eat it too. I, I think that's what people like to hear. But I know that in this industry, we have a lot of software that was built a while ago, and you know it does take work to get that to the point where you can do this. So, Tim, what, what's your viewpoint on that, and how do you guys face that challenge of wide orbit of where you put your dollars for the future and for current tech? Well, one one thing I'll certainly say is I'll echo Glenn said delicately. I won't be nearly as elegant with my terminology as uh, as Glenn sort of puts it, but I think the if I was to summarise it, it's highly consolidated. Uh, on one side, 
as Glenn indicated, um, our customers provide revenue. We have to meet their needs. At the same time, there is a, a looking into the future, and, and Wide Orbit has been one that has, I guess, been very much at the forefront of pushing in certain areas, spending dollars in, let's call it programmatic, in an area that we've foreseen the industry needs to go. Um, at the same time, now let's talk, you know, reality around that is that in pushing things forward, you still need to talk and listen to your, to your customers. And so there are times, and quite recently that's actually been the case of Wide Orbit, where there has actually been a pivot um, to be able to say, hey, we recognise who our clients are, we're going to meet their needs, we will pivot and address those needs, and then as far as meeting what the industry is actually going to require, maybe the approach that we once took of attempting to build what we would call a full super stack may not have been actually the way to go. Maybe in our humility we sit back and say, hmm, we need to actually open up and integrate with others to be able to create a full suite of solutions. So I would simply say consolidate in the end. So it's interesting because we talk about this idea of opening up, which I think, um, you know, as, as Al said, I, I give the broadcasters credit in that they have pushed the vendors to be more open, and I think that's a great thing, and it's time for us to step up. I would say my prediction over the next one to four years is there is going to be massive consolidation in the vendor space. So while we're going to be open, I think there's actually going to be uh, several larger, almost fully end-to-end -end solutions rebuilt into those, yet they'll work across each other. What do you guys think? I'm just going to go right down the line. I think, I'm so I, 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 no one will argue with you know at this point in time that you know everything needs to be open. We need to follow open, open standards. We need to have canonical standards. We need to use you know real time interfaces using things like REST. But in addition to that, I'm going to go a step farther. Is that I believe that that we need to we need to embrace the heterogeneous world, right? Where it's not all one vendor. And that means that software needs to be modular in nature. So pieces that we have in our platform that our, our media customers can freely choose what they want to use or not want to use. And those, those modular pieces of the software need to be openly interoperable with, you know, perhaps even competitors' pieces of software, right, that are out there. And, and that requires API, but it requires a modular architecture. I, I think that's true, but at the same time, it is going to be a higher cost to somebody who decides to have multiple vendors in, even in their stack. Even if they fully play with one another, there's more to manage and it's just going to cost them more dollar-wise, period. Without a doubt, it's going to cost more to manage multiple vendors, but you're, you're also you know, you know, dealing with <laughs> systems that you know, have been entrenched there for a long period of time and they work and it costs significant money to unfork all of that when you may just want, you know, a new engine to do one aspect. And, and you know, I think as software vendors, we need to build modular, right? the technology and the architecture advancements are there, but we build modular architecture, as microservice is all about. Um, and I think that we should, you know, you know, being good vendor partners to the community, that's the way we need to build. Bunker from a consolidation standpoint, we kind of all play in a similar vein. You're a bit out of that vein, but do you think consolidation will happen across all types of things? I don't know, I don't know if I'll speak to consolidation or not, but I think uh, we do need to coalesce around the way we do business and some operational uh, standards. <clears throat> so innovation, you know, out of necessity probably breaks a bunch of things that we now have to fix. So we spend our time on two things, one fixing the things that we, the innovation caused to fail, but also innovating. I, I think the, your point about consolidation though is there is going to be a, a way that seems better um, as we move forward than other ways. And so we will have to, you know, align around some of those. An example of that for us really is, is uh, in the set up the OD world that's sort of through Comcast and come through the MVPDs, um, those are well gardens operationally. Um, assets are pushed in there, and a pointer is returned that 
It's just unique to those platforms. We're working on an initiative to incorporate that pointer into a basket so that now we've taken a bunch of the impression-based inventory across digital and now set up BMD, and campaign execution can now occur the same way it does across all that impression-based inventory. I think ultimately we're going to see linear start to make moves to let dynamic ad insertion activate and ad campaigns, which might make that start to work the same way too. So I think we'll see some natural flow of coalescing around some right ways to do it. This is necessarily going to apply to changing all of our buying strategies and reporting strategies. Those are going to have to fix themselves. But as far as down here in the in getting creative and moved around, characterized, quantified, so that it can feed better up into the activation layers, the campaign management layers, we're actively working trying to create ways to make that more consumable across the other two things. And I think those are we see tech stacks starting to align, we're going to start seeing some consolidation. I don't know whether that's that's all these vendors, but it's certainly consolidated surround solutions. I'd like to hit on two things in particular. Um, one, as it relates to, let's call it modulizing the, um, the, the platforms themselves. I can appreciate that there's an, an option there to, to modularize, um, but absolutely have to agree to the point that there is, when that occurs, there is fragmentation, there is cost that's associated with that in between attempting to maintain those between vendors. Um, there's a really good case study on that apparently tomorrow morning if anyone's interested about best of three versus best, best in class, right? Come and attend that one tomorrow, here 10.30. Um, as far as consolidation goes, um, the, the thought there is that when we just simply think about business life cycle, um, you know, sim simply some, some simple fundamentals here is that within our industry there are certain elements of this that are still going through the emerging stages through the growth stages we have fragmentation i'll use one example one happens to be let's call it attribution um, we're starting to talk about a number of companies that are out there that are attempting to provide attribution to let's call it linear models to complement what occurs on the video in, in the digital space right now, the, the number of attribution companies that are out there is not sustainable, okay? So what will ultimately occur is there it will be one spiral of the fittest, two will actually then be some, some consolidation, and it will likely come into some form of other company within the tech stack that will integrate that into their offering, right? So that's where I see on the peripheral those companies that are coming into the industry now and providing services, there are those that are well established that are already in the maturity phase. It's going to take a, a large uh, company, group, etc., that wants an end to end solution to consolidate to that extent. Um, that would be a far bigger pill to swallow. Sure. I mean, but I guess Blackstone and TCG, they're welcome to come in and pay $10 billion for Nielsen. <laughs> I'll take the bill.